Chapter 13, Unfortunate Conclusions. With his mouth shut tight and his feet moving as fast as thoughts could make them, Milo ran all the way back to the car. There was great excitement when he arrived. His talk raced happily down the road to greet him. The humbug personally accepted all congratulations from the crowd. Where is the sound? Scribbled hastily uh, someone on the blackboard, and they all waited anxiously for the reply. Milo caught his breath, picked up the chalk, and explained simply, It's on the tip of my tongue. Several people excitedly threw their hands into the air. Some shouted what they would have been allowed, hurrah, and the rest pushed the heavy cannon into place. They aimed it directly at the thickest part of the fortress wall and packed it full of gunpowder. Milo stood on tiptoes, leaned over the cannon's mouth, and parted his lips. The small sound dropped silently to the bottom and everything was ready. In another moment, the fuse was lit and sputtering. I hope no one gets hurt, thought Milo. And before he had time to think again, an immense cloud of gray and white smoke leapt from the gun, and along with it, so softly that it was hardly heard, came out the sound of, but it flew toward the wall in several seconds in a high, lazy arc, and then struck ever so lightly just to the right of the big door. For an instant, there was an ominous stillness, quieter and more silent than ever before, as if even the air was holding its breath. And then... Almost immediately, there was a blasting, roaring, thundering smash, followed by a crushing, shattering, bursting crash as every stone in the fortress came toppling to the ground, and the vaults burst open, spilling the sound of history into the wind. Every sound that had ever been uttered or made, from way back to when there were none, to way up to when there were too many, came hurtling out of the debris in a way that sounded as though everything in the world was laughing, whistling, shouting, crying, singing, whispering, humming, screaming, coughing, sneezing, all at the same time. But there were bits of old speeches floating around as well as recited lessons, gunshots from old wars, babies' cries, auto horns, waterfalls, electric fans, galloping horses, and a great deal of everything else. For a while there was total and deafening confusion, and then almost as quickly as they'd come, all the old sounds disappeared over the hill in search of their new freedom and things were normal again. The people quickly went about their busy talkative business and in the smoke and dust cleared out, only Milo, Talk, and the humbug noticed the soundkeeper sitting discontentedly on a pile of rubble. I'm terribly sorry, said Milo sympathetically as the three of them went to console her. But we, we had to do it, added Talk, sniffing around the ruins. What a terrible mess, observed the humbug with his knack for saying exactly the wrong thing. The soundkeeper looked around with an expression of unrelieved sadness on her face. It'll take years to collect all those sounds again, she sobbed. And even longer, to put them back in proper order, it's, it's all my fault. You can't improve sound by having only silence. The problem is to use each at the, the proper time. She spoke, and as she spoke, the familiar and unmistakable squint, 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 scrunch of the din's heavy footsteps could be heard, heard plodding over the hill. And, and when she finally appeared, he was dragging an incredibly large sack behind him. Peg won't use these sounds, he puffed, mopping his forehead. They all came over the hill at once, and none were awful enough for me to keep. The soundkeeper peered into the sack, and there were all these the sounds which had burst from the vaults. After how nice of you to return them, she cried happily. You and the doctor must come by for an evening of beautiful music when my fortress is repaired. The thought of it so horrified the din that he excused himself immediately and dashed off down the road in a great panic. I hope I hadn't offended him, she said with some concern. He only likes unpleasant sounds, volunteered Tuck. Oh, yes, she sighed. I keep forgetting that many people do. But I suppose they are necessary, for you'd never really know how pleasant one was unless you knew how unpleasant it wasn't. She paused for a moment, then continued, If only rhyme and reason were here, I'm sure things would improve. That's why we're going to rescue them, said Milo proudly. What a long, hard journey that'll be. You'll need some nourishment, she cried, handing Milo a small brown package, neatly wrapped and tied with a string. Now remember... They're not for eating, but for listening, because you'll often be hungry for sounds as well as food. Here are street noises at night, train whistles a long way off, dry leaves burning, busy department stores, crunching toast, 
creaking bed springs, and of course, all kinds of laughter. There's a little of each, and in a far off, lonely place, I, I think you'll be glad to have them. I'm sure we will, replied Milo gratefully. Just take this road to the sea and turn left, she told them. You'll soon be in Digitopolis. And almost before she'd finished, they had said goodbye and left the valley behind. The shoreline was peaceful and flat, and the calm sea bumped it playfully along the sandy beach in the in the distance, a beautiful island covered the palm trees, and flowers beckoned invitingly from the sparkling water. Nothing can possibly go wrong now, cried the humbug happily. And as soon as he said it, he leapt from the car as if struck by a pin and sailed all the way to the tiny island. And we'll have plenty of time, answered Tak, who hadn't noticed that the bug was missing, and he too suddenly leapt into the air and disappeared. Certainly couldn't be a nicer day, agreed Milo, who was too busy looking at the road to see that the others had gone, and in a split second, he was also gone. He landed next to Tak and the terrified humbug on the tiny island, which now looked completely different. Instead of palms and flowers, there were only rocks and twisted stumps of long dead trees. Certainly didn't seem like the same place they'd seen from the road. Pardon me, said Milo to the first man who happened by. Can you tell me where I am? Pardon me, replied the man. Can you tell me who I am? The man was dressed in a shaggy tweed jacket and knickers with long woolen stockings and a cap that had a, a peak both front and back, and he seemed as confused as he could be. You must know who you are, said Milo impatiently. You must know where you are, he replied with equal annoyance. Oh dear, this is going to be difficult, Milo whispered to Tuck. I wonder if we can help him. They conferred for a few minutes, and finally the bug looked up and said, Can you describe yourself? Yes, indeed, the man replied happily. I'm as tall as can be, and, and he grew straight up until all that could be seen of him were his shoes and stockings. And I'm as short as can be, and he shrank down to the size of a pebble. And I'm as generous as can be, he said, handing each of them a large red apple. And I'm as selfish as can be, he snarled, grabbing them back again. And I'm as strong as can be, he roared, lifting an enormous boulder over his head. And I'm as weak as can be, he gasped, staggering under the weight of his hat. I'm as smart as can be, he remarked, as he, he, to, in twelve different languages. And I'm as stupid as can be, he admitted, putting both feet in one shoe. I'm as graceful as can be, he hummed, balancing on one toe. And I'm as clumsy as can be, he cried. Sticking his thumb in his eye, I'm, I'm as fast as can be, he announced, running around the island twice in no time at all, and I'm as slow as can be, he complained, waving goodbye to a snail. Is that any help to you? Once again they conferred in busy whispers, till all three agreed. It's really very simple, said the humbug, twirling his cane. If everything you say is true, added Tok, then without a doubt, Milo concluded brightly, you must be candy. Of course, yes, of course, the man shouted. Why, why didn't I think of that? I, I, I'm as happy as can be. Then he quickly sat down, put his head in his hands, and sighed. <laughs> I'm also as sad as can be. Now, will you tell us, well, me, where, you, where we are? Asked Tak as he looked around the desolate island. To be sure, said Canby. You're on the island of conclusions. Make yourself at home. You're apt to be here for some time. How did we get here, asked Milo, who was still a bit puzzled by being there at all. You jumped, of course, explained Canby. That's the way most everyone gets here. It's really, really quite simple. Every time you decide something without having a good reason, you jump to conclusions, whether you like it or not. It's such an easy trip to make that I've been here hundreds of times. But it's such an unpleasant-looking place, Milo said. Yes, it's true, remarked Canby. It, it does look much better from a distance. As he spoke, at least eight or nine more people sailed onto the island from every direction possible. Well, I'm going to jump right back, announced the humbug, who took two or three practice bends, leapt as far as he could, and landed in a heap two feet away. That won't do at all, scolded Canby, helping him to his feet. 
You can never jump away from conclusions. Getting back is not so easy. That's why we're so terribly crowded here. That was certainly the truth. Uh, uh, for all along the bleak shore and clustered on the rocks for as far as anyone could see, there were enormous crowds of people, all sadly looking out to sea. Uh, isn't there even a boat? Asked Milo, anxious to get on with the trip. Oh, no, <laughs> replied Canby, shaking his head. The only way back to is to swim, and that's a very long and hard way. I don't like to get wet, moaned the unhappy bug, and he, and he shuddered at the thought. Neither do they, said Canby, sadly. It's what keeps him here. But I wouldn't worry too much about it, for you can swim all day in the sea of knowledge and come out completely dry. Most people do. But you must excuse me now. I have to greet the new arrivals, as you know. I'm as friendly as can be. Over the humbug's strenuous objections, Milo and Tok decided to swim, and, protesting loudly, the bug was dragged along with him towards the sea. Canby hurried off to answer more questions, and the last thing he was heard to say was, Pardon me, can you tell me who I am? They swam and swam and swam for what seemed like hours, and only Tok's firm encouragement kept Milo struggling through the icy water. At last they reached the shore, Thoroughly exhausted, and except for the bug, completely soaked. That wasn't bad at all, said the humbug, straightening his tie and brushing himself off. I, I must visit there again. I'm sure you will, gasped Milo, but from now on, I'm going to have to have a very good reason before I make up my mind about anything. You can lose too much time jumping to conclusions. The car was just where they'd left it, and in a moment they were on their way again, as if the road turned away from the sea and began its long climb into the mountains. The warm sun and billowy breezes dried them as they went. Oh, I hope we reach Digitopolis soon, said Milo, thinking of the breakfast they hadn't eaten. I wonder how far it is.